Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsis with Mike Borza, who's going to talk today about AI security, or lack thereof. Mike, what is the state of AI security at this point? Oh, good question, Ed. It's largely uh, ignored. And uh, right now, people are just coming to the point that they're starting to realize that uh, it's an issue. But uh, there's a lot of resistance. As in every new market, uh, most people want to focus on the functionality and the secret sauce and all the good stuff that uh, goes along with the um, development of the technology, and they don't want to deal with uh, some of the issues that come up as you start to deploy it in real systems. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure, I'd be happy to. So Mike, typically when you design a system, you want to start from scratch with things like security, you want to start with performance, uh, power. It seems like AI has sort of pushed the ball forward going, well, we just need to get these things working. We'll fill in all the holes after that. Is that what's happened? Are we now at the point where people are saying, well, there's a lot of value here? Yeah, I don't think that that's unusual for AI uh, compared with any other market. We saw this in the development of the Internet. We're seeing it in the development of the Internet of Things. Um, and so security is an afterthought in the first generation of these products. And then people start to understand that there are uh, security issues that actually um, go to the value of the system and whether or not it becomes trustworthy. And in the case of AI, because you have huge volumes of data that are needed uh, to do the training, you have huge volumes of data that are dealt with by devices. Uh, in some cases, the devices communicate with the uh, data centers to provide continuous feedback about how well the AI engines are working to provide new uh, data that's used to train the networks. And uh, they become large agglomerators of uh, information. And so uh, it becomes very quickly apparent that you need to take security into account when designing these things. So I, I don't think it's unique to AI. Um, AI has the opportunity and it has a lot of smart people involved in it. Um, in the development of the technology that uh, should be able to recognize the value of what they're doing uh, now and how they want to um, address it early rather than waiting for problems and then addressing it later with Band-Aid fixes. But AI also has the uh, two problems going for it, right? One is that there's so much data that it's easy to add something in there that it's hard to find. And the second thing is that what you develop is not necessarily what you see as the end product because that product is supposed to change with it and operate within a parameter. Yeah, this is one of the things that you hear AI people talking about all the time is that the uh, structure of the network, once it's been trained, uh, is not necessarily obvious. And so the interrelationship of the um, data that's in the neural networks is not, uh, especially during the inferencing phase, is not easily um, identified with the behaviors. And so it's possible to do things to the training data sets to create um, the opportunity for Trojans actually in the training data. That Trojan just continues to exist inside the uh, trained neural net. And uh, at that point, uh, it's simply a matter of stimulating the Trojan in a way that evokes the behavior that you're looking for um, to produce a kind of uh, attack response. And so it's possible that uh, people are training uh, AIs right now using biased data uh, that has been designed in such a way as to evoke a response later. And so you've seen extreme versions of this, um, things like uh, single pixel changes to images that produce wildly different responses in the, uh, in the neural net output. And that's a symptom of uh, a network which is not necessarily well understood and is not necessarily stable, so that it operates in a local minimum near uh, an optimal behavior in a very narrow range, and then it's easily pushed outside of that uh, minimum and into a more global minimum uh, in the behavior that the neural net response uh, evokes. And that's one of the interesting things about AI is that you can have this little change that has a big impact somewhere else down the line, right? It is. It's a phenomenally interesting uh, feature of uh, neural networks in general. And the deeper the neural net, the better. And so people ascribe higher value right now to very deep neural nets. But they're also the neural nets that are most um, responsive to um, being provoked into, uh, you know, sort of poor behaviors. So you have some approaches to dealing with this where people are intentionally trying to introduce noise in the training data. 
uh, in order to make the neural net uh, behave in a more stable manner or to try to give it a larger stable operating uh, envelope. And uh, that's a, a good approach, I think. Uh, I'm not an expert in neural nets and training neural nets and, and you know, designing neural nets to inference different kinds of things, but that certainly seems to me to be a sensible approach because neural nets are really modeling a, you know, a very analog view of the world. And so adding noise into the training data to make it immune to that noise um, seems like a good, uh, a good approach. You know, you're essentially building filters into the uh, neural net that take out some of that um, very unstable response. But at the same time, uh, you have to be concerned as uh, someone who's training neural nets and collecting large data sets uh, for those uh, neural nets that somebody is not introducing bias into the training data that's going to be used later to influence the behavior of the networks that operate in the field. And so uh, from that point of view, you know, integrity of this data that's being sent to the data center, you know, in many cases it's being collected from remote whatever kind of sensors out here. These could be cameras, they can be microphones for audio data, they could be all kinds of things um, that people are collecting up responses from. They're bringing it all back into the data center and spending a lot of time and effort to uh, train these uh, neural nets to behave in certain ways. That information is pushed out to you know, a set of embedded neural net chips that are sitting in the field. And at that point, you've got now a fairly static uh, neural net that's uh, being trained to operate on this data set. So protecting the integrity of this data is key. Um, and certainly if you're sending data back from the cloud, or back through the cloud to the uh, data centers to update the models, um, then these chips should also be securing uh, the integrity of that data as they're transmitting it. And one of the other issues that goes on here is that training data as it's it's developed is used to train other machines right and other training data so if you have a bias it potentially gets replicated down the ro road to the point where you can no longer find it yeah you're starting to see cases where people take uh, common data sets and use them to train neural nets for different kinds of behaviors and some of those common data sets have serious defects in them um, you know sort of the most glaring examples of this are things uh, involving the recognition of people and uh, different uh, people with different uh, facial features, different uh, skin pigmentation are recognized or not recognized or less or better recognized according to what the biases were in the training data. Um, this tells you that you do need large, wildly diverse data sets in order to be able to um, deal with networks that are um, going, or for the networks to be producing general responses that are, uh, you know, highly uh, flexible and that are representative of the range of responses you're looking for. So bias in the data sets results in bias in the operation of the network. And if that bias is introduced by data that's moving around through the network, um, that gets to be a, a serious problem. Um, similarly, you know, the models themselves that are being operated on, that's another place to attack. So the model represents the distillation of all the training data. If someone is intelligent enough to be able to change the model, in a way that they can predict uh, behavior, um, th they found another way to embed a Trojan. And so protecting the integrity of that model is hugely important. I would argue that if you spend a lot of time and money and energy training uh, your neural network, you also want to protect the confidentiality of that model. And so that's another kind of key factor. Is it the same issues as you get into the uh, inferencing side? Is that a source of concern from security, or is it still on the, all on the training side? No, uh, training side is important, and I think people have started to recognize it. But you have the same problem um, for a, you know, a chip. So if this is uh, an embedded uh, neural network chip that's uh, operating uh, in some device, it's collecting data from some sensors, and it's going to uh, use that data to make calculations about what kinds of activations or actuations are going to be enabled, whether that's you know, unlocking a cell phone or um, unlocking your car using some biometric data like a fingerprint or your uh, face image. That's uh, one kind of AI, but um, there are other kinds of AIs that are being embedded all over the place, you know, the kinds of things that are used in autonomous uh, vehicles. And so in that case, you have to be concerned about the integrity of the data coming from the sensors. Um, we're starting to see car manufacturers who are getting to be very uh, sensitive to protecting the integrity of the data that comes from 
cameras and uh, radar, LIDAR systems that are located uh, at the extremities of the vehicle, and data is being uh, accumulated um, through a set of neural net engines, and then subsequently higher layers of intelligence are brought to bear on uh, the data fusion of all those sensors and producing you know, useful kinds of behaviors for driving those things. So integrity is important there. Confidentiality is not so important. I, I tend to feel that integrity is really uh, one of the critical things that people should be wanting to protect in terms of protecting data and the models, um, and less so uh, confidentiality. Confidentiality goes to protecting all of the intellectual property that's represented by the neural net, the programming around it, and all of the control programs that uh, are running based on that. Let's make this even more complicated. Now we're starting to throw in the edge because there's too much data being produced by the sensors at the edge, so some of this has to be pre-processed. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got another potential AI algorithm which is additive to the AI algorithm that's going on further down the road throughout the system, so the, the beginning of the edge, the, the middle of the edge, the edge of the edge, and then into the data center. Yep. Um, you're getting this tendency now to try and distill data, either right at the point at which it's uh, being processed, producing some kind of composite representation or compressed representation of that data to send back to the cloud. Um, or in the case of sensors that are uh, communicating together, you're trying to produce higher levels of complexity, very much as the um, image processing of the brain has a very primitive function that responds to the eye. Um, but it, you know, even at that level, it's doing a significant amount of uh, interpolation and uh, motion estimation and filling in details that are not actually present in the visual image that you get from a human eye, but then at higher levels of processing, you now have motion tracking and uh, target tracking, things like that, and then uh, cognition that goes along with that. And those are all different levels of uh, neural net that operate on data that's being accumulated. You're starting to see the same kind of architectures being duplicated in uh, complex systems that integrate many sensors, many actuators, and inputs from uh, you know broad spectrum of sources. And so now you have multiple places that you can attack. Your attack service is now not just one place where you thought it was. It's now every different level that you potentially can come in on this, right? Exactly right. And so you're starting to see people who are worried about um, adding a root of trust that they have uh, that ties a cryptographic identity for this chip uh, to the keys that are used to do the various kinds of encryption here. Um, there's communication interfaces that hook up to either other devices locally, devices in the, uh, in the hubs that are nearby. So you're on a LAN that's very high bandwidth compared with the internet. Um, and so those things need to share a root of trust, or at least they need to know that each other is trustworthy. Um, and so these kinds of root of trust products are starting to be very important in these architectures. And actually the nice thing about uh, these architectures, they're very big chips. And uh, the root of trust occupies a very small amount of space in those chips um, for a very high amount of uh, benefit because you now can assure yourself that everything that's in the network locally that's being used to distill data is uh, trusted and is part of the local network. It's not something that was just added into the network to um, you know, cause havoc. So you've now added in not only um Yes, you can stop and you can put in your root of trust and you can understand where the, the keys are and the authentication that goes into this network. But a lot of these uh, security risks in AI are over time. So you've added in a fourth dimension here, which doesn't even exist on the, the current roadmap for how you solve security issues. Generally not. Um, one of the things that means is that you're going to have to be adaptable. Um, security th threats only get more capable over time, uh, so you need to be dealing with the fact that you're going to get security updates in systems like this. Um, you need to recover in cases where the security of an entire system has been um, breached completely. And so all of those things argue, uh, again, in favor of these strong roots of trust that uh, have a, a nugget of real hard security in the center of the chip that can be used to rebuild trust and rebuild um, the integrity of a network of uh, things that are operating together in a cooperative manner. Does it force you to rethink how you go about security too? So for example, while certain things can be put in place and you can put a perimeter around certain things, you also need to understand how data is moving. Is there an aberration in this? Um, is something going, is this an unusual event that we didn't expect? Yeah, we're starting to see some really sophisticated uh, technology being brought to bear. You can see it in some of the programs that uh, 
people like DARPA are running, where they're looking to secure the chip at multiple levels. They need to be able to supervise the operation of the chip. And really what you're now developing is a chip that consists of many layers. There's a security layer underneath, which is just watching um, what's happening with the chip. It provides the root of trust capabilities. It also supplies the on-chip communication capabilities. So you're starting to see products that uh, look at the traffic on the bus. They analyze what the bus is actually doing. They're looking for anomalous behaviors. They're looking for devices that communicate with each other that shouldn't be or for devices that are communicating um, through illegal protocols or things that weren't authorized to be there. And uh, you're starting to see this kind of substrate of security technology built into the fabric of the chip. Uh, and then the traditional sort of SOC that we've come to um, expect over the last 20 years exists above that on top of that foundation of security. And so I, I really, I mean, as a security guy, I'm excited because we haven't seen this before. but I also think it gives us, for the first time, the possibility that we can build really hard security into these uh, kinds of products. Is there a way of looking at the algorithms and saying, okay, this has a weakness in it, inherent? Have we gotten as sophisticated yet, or are we still a ways away? I think we're a ways away. Um, in some of the network intrusion products and uh, some of the network supervision products, you're starting to see AI technology be brought to bear. And it's kind of amusing because we're, you know, we're talking about AI is doing something recognizably useful for people here. But now uh, people are bringing AI to bear on both the, um, the defense side, but also on the adversary side. So people are using AIs uh, in the attack networks to try to uh, probe the networks, use uh, a catalog of existing behaviors and start probing down each of the facets of, uh, or down each of the axes of, um, you know, possible attack vectors to see how far they can get, what they can find. Um, the odds are stacked in favor of the attackers in that case because they only have to succeed once. It's the old security paradigm of, you know, we have to defend against this uh, and succeed always. They only have to find a, a successful hole once. Um, so that's a kind of interesting thing that's happening right now. So both on the attack and on the defense side, people are using AI to try to defend against these kinds of attacks. The attackers are using AI now, starting to use AI to try to uh, probe the networks that uh, they're uh, operating in. And also you can take a look at the programming habits of a person or a team. What have they created in the past and analyze that and go at it from that level too, right? There is a lot of that going on. Um, you're starting to see it now, which is why you're starting to see um, some kinds of products that are trying to uh, help um, defeat that. So you want, you know, from a programming point of view, you want to have a very high standard of quality for uh, programming. You want to avoid all the, you know, the simple breaches like buffer overflows and all the things that lead to very stupid behaviors. We've seen bizarre side channels, or at least very difficult um, to understand side channels that were built into the architectures of the chips. So things like Spectre and Meltdown in the past 18 months um, came to the fore. Um, they represented a new kind of attack, and you know that's a fruitful avenue for both the researchers, but also for uh, hackers who are going to uh, try to probe these networks using all those kinds of side channels. Side channels in general are uh, becoming more and more important and the, the ability to defend against those is becoming more important. And I think we're starting to see some interesting defenses that are starting to address those, but you know that's going to be a several year project to uh, really mature that technology. Mike Borza, thanks for a great explanation and also a rather scary one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but uh, that's the world we live in.